Okay, welcome back for continuation of a wonderfully inspirational morning. Dorica Blackman uh, graduated from Stanford in 1991, and we were very fortunate that she came back um, full time about five years ago. She's the Assistant Vice Provost and Executive Director of the Diversity and Inclusion Office at Stanford. And as you'll see, she's a very passionate speaker, as well as being a trainer, facilitator, national expert on topics of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And for more than 25 years, she's consulted with a wide variety of groups to facilitate these uncommon conversations on issues of race, gender, class, and social justice. She co-teaches the intergroup communications um, and also teaches courses on solidarity and racial justice and advanced facilitation skills. So welcome, Dorica. accomplishments and intentions are for the future. I love the little Breaking Barriers program and it's wonderful to see us moving that into action in our thoughts. As has been said, my name is Dorica Blackman and I use she or they pronouns and I like to let you know what my gender pronouns are because you can't tell what they are by looking at me. I also want to just take a moment to acknowledge that we are on the land of native peoples. In fact, the Mwekma Ohlone tribe are the ancestors of this land. And I just wanted to think for a little bit about their sacrifice and the love that they put into this place and how we are beneficiaries of that love and sacrifice. Thank you. So both of those actions, naming my pronouns, acknowledging Native peoples, are acts of allyship that I practice for communities that are not my own. Often we try to think of what are the little micro inclusions that we can do that signal to other people that we're conscious of their identities. And while not in every setting do I include the acknowledgement of Native land, I always introduce myself with the gender pronouns uh, because I travel to a lot of places in the world where people are unfamiliar with that kind of introduction or even the concept of they and them pronouns. That might be you, so fortunately we have a question and answer period where I encourage you to ask about that if it's something you're unfamiliar with. So today I'm here to talk to you about some of our best practices here at Stanford uh, and some of the practices that we are working on in the world around the topics of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And so this is my opportunity to introduce some ideas to you and then have some time for questions from you about how you engage with these. I'll say a little bit about our office. I've been here, as was said, for about five years. Stanford was a client in my diversity, inclusion, and consulting practice when I first got here for the first year. And then I've been the director of the office. And in the five years since I've been here, we've done some version of the workshop that you're about to see for about 30,000 students, staff, faculty, and alum. So there may be a couple of you who have seen some version of this before, so I encourage you to bear with us, but hopefully some of it will feel new um, and you'll be able to engage some of the questions. In the School of Medicine, we've been engaging in programs for the last couple of years. We are a part of the orientation for every incoming med student. We also were involved in the transition program to residency, and this year we started the second year of teaching a course on humanistic medicine that incorporates a lot of of the principles that you're going to see. So we've been very proud of our partnership with the medical school and the forward thinking uh, that you all have done as a division. So I want to talk a little bit today about constructive discomfort. Uh, and so I wanna tell a little bit of my story to start that conversation. So I am originally from Detroit, Michigan, and I love being from Detroit because almost everyone in the community that I grew up in was black. And it was a wonderful thing to grow up in an environment with so many people who shared my cultural heritage and black background. Almost every mayor that I had was black, the police chief was black, the people who committed crimes were black, the remedial students were black. And I went to a high school for ninth grade with 4,000 gifted and talented students. 80% of them were black. I had a black dentist. How many people have had a black dentist? Okay, one, two, three, all right, you thought about it. You said, oh wait, yes, I did have that. Uh, and as I went out in the world, I went to boarding school in East Hampton, Massachusetts. 
Yes, so you understand. I had a, I'm an experienced person with culture shock from a very young age. And then I came to Stanford, as you heard, as an undergraduate. And as I went out in the world, I began to encounter a number of stereotypes about African Americans. People would say things like, well, you know, black people don't really ski. And I would say, well, I'm from Michigan. Black people have ski clubs and actually have since the 50s. Uh, and so they would say things, you know, black people don't swim. And um, thanks to Stanford, we now win gold medals in swimming. So it's wonderful to have advanced past some of those ideas. But what I came to conclude was that people were really ignorant. And I didn't mean that in a pejorative way. I meant it as in do not know. Because everything you know about any group of people is really limited to your sample size, right? It's what your parents taught you, what your education taught you, what the media teaches you, and whatever direct contact you've had with that group, whether it's people with a physical disability or people who are transgender or, like in my case, people who are black. And so I wanted to think more about how we could challenge some of those stereotypes. And from boarding school on, I became curious about what my role or responsibility was to challenge those ideas. I'm also first generation and a low income alum from Stanford, which the students here call FLI, F-L-I, for first generation and or low income. So I'm happy to know that I'm FLI because like some of you, <laughs> I, I really, low income was not a label that I was publicly giving to myself as an undergraduate. And I've been really grateful to learn so much from our students who embrace that identity. And what they like to say is that I didn't overcome my low income background. I am who I am because of it. What is the resilience that it takes to arrive at this place from the place that I began? Right? So we began to think about identity as an asset. So I come to Stanford as an undergraduate, and I get involved in activism right away. I was part of that rowdy group in 1987, 88, who changed the core curriculum, which was called at that time Western culture. And we had this radical notion that maybe we should study more than in the West. And we changed the curriculum to cultures, ideas, and values. Some of us remember that Donald Kennedy, who was our president at the time, went on national public television and debated Secretary of Education William Bennett. Alan Bloom wrote a book and said we were closing the American mind. And I was 18, and I said, yes, we were ruining American education. And and that was a wonderful thing to be doing at that time. So I became quite militant. And by the time I took intergroup communication uh, my sophomore year, I was ready to take on the challenge of identity. The class functions, we talk about race, gender, socioeconomic status, and now we talk about sexual orientation, which we did it back in 1989 when I took it. The way the class works is we get students from each one of the groups. So when we're doing race, we break up into our racial groups. And groups come up with anonymous questions for all the other groups. Each group takes a turn sitting in the middle of the floor, answering those anonymous questions from the other groups. Now, when I tell people that, some of you have that look of shock and are really worried about what might happen in such a caustic environment. This quarter, we had 250 students on the waiting list for that class. Because what we recognize is that many of us, especially at this time in our country and in our world, want a way to engage in these concepts. We just want structures to be able to do so. So on the first day that I took a class, took that class, we uh, talked about race. In fact, the class was started in 1968 as a way to talk about the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. So I took the class in 1989. We talked about race. And on the first day, I made a white woman cry. And I don't remember exactly what it was that I said, but I remember feeling a little apathetic about it. She should cry. Racism sucks. And now she knows how I feel. And then a funny thing happened. We were in the same group for the entire rest of the course. And when we got to socioeconomic status, she shared that she was from Appalachia. And if you're unfamiliar, Appalachia is one of the lowest income communities in the United States, and it is predominantly white. And I had what I like to call the aha moment. There's something called in psychology the iceberg theory of culture, and it says the mass of who a person is is below the surface. What we can see is only a tiny portion of who they are. And I realized at that point that I thought that everyone white at Stanford was wealthy. 
I tell my students, I now co-teach the class, as you heard, with Hazel Marcus, a noted, really kind of the pioneer of cultural psychology. And I tell my students their job is to complicate the narrative. Too often in our society, we're focused on a singular story around who people are that only recognizes that piece beyond the surface. So when I had these aha moments, I been, became fascinated with the idea that we could create structures that would allow for this deeper conversation. Right? And so normally when we do this workshop, we have you up and moving and doing something experiential, but we have just a limited time today, so I'll talk to you about the concepts and move from there. This is how this became my life's work. I wanted to have those aha moments. We also are experiencing something in our country, I do a lot of work in corporate settings, called diversity fatigue. And diversity fatigue is that thing where you say you're going to talk about diversity and inclusion, and some people say, oh, really, why? <laughs> and that's because diversity and inclusion consulting hasn't always been that great. It's fallen into one of two categories. Either it's the check the box training, which means we're gonna do training because we have to do training and let's get it over with as quickly as possible and hope nothing upsets anyone, all right? How many people have had a don't rock the boat, check the box training? Right, lots of you. The other kind of training is the blame and shame training. And it says we're gonna talk about who the problem is, sit them in the center of the room, publicly castigate them, and then everyone's gonna feel really uncomfortable. <laughs> Anybody ever been to a blame and shame training? Yes, some of you. So we had a radical notion in our office and in my practice that we could have hard conversations and that we would enjoy them. That we might even say that they were fun or cool. And so that's been the bar that we've set for ourselves, is to have a deep conversation, right? But to have it be engaging and enlightening and fun. So that's what I'll check out with you is whether today was both challenging and at least a little positively engaging. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Great, fabulous. All right, so constructive discomfort is part of the notion that we're teaching. And I wanna start by giving some context. I work at Stanford, so I don't love definitions because students will challenge you, especially our undergraduates, on everything from Wikipedia to their mom's dissertation, right? And so I get caught up in a lot of arguments if I'm not careful. So what I love instead are metaphors. So here are four words, diversity, inclusion, belonging, and equity. We use these words interchangeably because we don't really know what they all mean. So some of you may have heard this, a version of this metaphor, but what we like to say is diversity is being invited to the dance. Inclusion is being asked to dance. Belonging is being able to dance however you want. And equity is having a turn picking the DJ. Okay, now what do we mean by that? Diversity is a fact, inclusion is a practice, equity is the goal. Diversity is the reality of our world and now we're trying to figure out whether our environments, our practices, our social settings, our friend groups are gonna reflect that diversity of the world. That's awareness. We're becoming more and more aware. We're becoming aware of concepts like non-binary gender that some of us haven't heard phrased in those ways before. Inclusion is a set of practices. I tell my clients that you have to be able to point to what it is that you're doing to create an inclusive environment. Your environment is either intentionally inclusive or it's exclusive, period. It's either intentionally inclusive or it's exclusive, period, because culture is shaped by leaders and by every member of that culture. People know the culture of your organization and of your team, and if you don't, you need to start investigating what it is. There's a culture there and it's shaped, right? Inclusion is a practice. So we'll talk a little bit about some of those practices today. Belonging is being able to dance how you want because some of us know that we've only been included under the condition that we act like the people who are already at the dance, right? Women are taught that we must assimilate into the behavior that's been established in our environments. And if we dare to dance our own dance that's unfamiliar to the men in our environment, we won't be as successful. How many people have been taught that you have to assimilate in order to be successful, right? That's the challenge, is being able to allow people to sit at the table who are different. It's a lot of work to have teams that are diverse. 
But over and over and over again, the research shows that when our teams are more diverse, they're more creative and thus more successful, especially when they involve diversity of gender, race, socioeconomic status, thought, all of those things. Now, we can all feel very good, but it's not the same as being paid the same, right? We can feel that sense of belonging, I'm included here, but equity is about power, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So one of the models we use, how many people have heard of a safe space? Yeah, okay, just about everyone by now, because it's a hotly contested conversation in education. Are our spaces too focused on being safe? So out of the University of Michigan and their Intergroup Dialogue Institute, we developed, uh, they developed this diagram that talks about creating spaces that are both safe and brave, right? And that's what we want, is we want to have people be able to move outside their comfort zone because that constructive discomfort is where the research tells us learning happens. So one of my goals, if I haven't achieved it already, is to make you uncomfortable because that's where learning happens. The green area called our comfort zone is where we kind of don't learn very much. It's who our friends are, where we get our media from, what we like already. But learning by definition means stepping into something we are unfamiliar with and often unfamiliar makes us uncomfortable. But that, as I said, is where the research tells us learning happens. What we don't want is for people to be in the danger zone, and that's the place where we shut down and we can no longer hear the message that's being given to us, right? What are some of the physiological things that happen in your body when you feel threatened or unsafe? Say that again. Tachycardia. <laughs> Only at the medical school. <laughs> yes, tachycardia. What else? Fear, Fear sweat. Okay, I should have started by saying I'm an old school K-12 teacher, so call and response is a big part of the agenda here. Things that happen in your body when you feel threatened. Tense. Tense. Anxiety. Shallow breathing. Some of us sh have to flee. We shut down. If I touch on something you don't like, it's a great time to answer that call, go to the bathroom. I'm checked out, right? And so if any point, today, which I don't anticipate, you feel something that makes you shut down, you get to say, ouch, and we'll stop and attend to what that is, right? And this is what we teach in our classes, that sometimes we need to pause and check in. I cannot know what will put you in the danger zone. Only you can calibrate that for yourself. But what I invite the students to do, right, is to calibrate the difference between being uncomfortable and being unsafe. Too often, the moment we feel uncomfortable, we call that unsafe and we shut down. Let's press ourselves to be more comfortable being uncomfortable. All right, social identity, most of you should be familiar with this concept, is a sense of who, a person's sense of who they are based upon their group membership. Here are some examples of social identities and there will be a quiz on this in about 15 seconds. Okay, these are by no means an exhaustive list of the social identity groups. There are a few things up here, ethnicity, nationality, class, marital status, citizenship. I just found out what virtual identity is. It has to do with how you perceived online, right? And that's a whole separate identity for some people, right? So here's the quiz. Which three words best describe your social identity? You're actually gonna have to do this, so you'll wanna pay attention now, because you're gonna turn to your neighbor and tell them those three words. Now, I know you want me to go back a slide, but I'm not going to. <laughs> That's why I said it was a quiz, because it's not about right or wrong. It's about you thinking quickly, not a wrong answer, about what three words describe your social identities. Now, I don't want you to say the type, like gender. I want you to say your gender, or not race, but your race, okay? Any of those words that describe your group membership that are most salient, most important to you. Now, here's the assignment. Pick three words, turn to your neighbor, say three words, and fall silent. I will tell you that no one ever succeeds at this assignment, but I'm going to give you a chance. All right, don't worry about having the right three words. Pick three words, turn to your neighbor, say three words, and fall silent. Go.
three words and then fall silent. Three words and fall silent. All right, raise your hand if you said a word that describes your race. Hands down, that describes your gender. Hands down, that describes your sexual orientation. Hands down, that describes your socioeconomic class. Hands down, that describes your nationality. Hands down, that describes your, let's see, marital or parenting status. Hands down, that describes your profession. Hands down, all right. Is there anyone who picked a word that describes their physical ability status? Now we know that ability, we have visible and invisible disabilities, but I wanna know if you picked a word that describes whether you have a physical disability or you are what my friends in the ability community call TAB, which stands for temporarily able-bodied. <laughs> Yes, ouch, the first time I heard that one. So if you said a word that describes whether you are a person with a physical disability or you are tab, raise your hand. All right, so just one or two. In a room about 300, I still have only one or two. I'm going to argue that your physical ability status is one of your most defining characteristics. If you are blind or deaf or in a wheelchair, you have to seek accommodations for that nearly everywhere you go. It is something you are always conscious of, always thinking about. The fact that you are not thinking about that is, what, is the dreaded P word. What's the P word? Privilege. How many people have had some discomfort with the word privilege at some point? Right, okay. Privilege is characterized by not thinking about some aspect of your identity. That is how you know it's a privilege. If you are not thinking about where it's safe to walk at night, you are probably a man. If you are not thinking about being stopped at a traffic stop in the United States, you're probably white. If you are not thinking about money, you are for sure not low income. Right? To not think about an aspect of your identity is a privilege. Right? And we're uncomfortable because the word privilege is only attached sometimes to a few identities, to race, to white privilege, to men's privilege, to wealth privilege. But all of us are carrying a complex set of privileges. Speaking English is a privilege. Your education is a privilege. Right? All of those things are privileges. And I just want to invite you to push yourself a little bit. Sometimes when we talk about privilege, people who are, for instance, white and come from low income backgrounds will say, well, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I'm not privileged. I work hard to get what I want. True. Absolutely. Right? But where I grew up, or where lots of us grew up, there were poor people on both sides of the tracks. Right? And if you were white and poor, you had a different experience than if you were a person of color and poor. We have to compare apples to apples, not apples to oranges, okay? So this is about power and consciousness. Here are four words, oppression, discrimination, prejudice, bias. Pick two and tell me what the difference is. No right or wrong answers, just guess. Two words, oppression, discrimination, prejudice, bias. Tell me what the difference is to just any two. Oh, Stanford. So afraid. Yes, go ahead. Oppression, oppression is an action. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's based on any of the bottom three. Mm-hmm. And bias is, um, it's one of the very bad words. Um, oh, it's not an English thing. Mm-hmm. You're doing great. <laughs> and, and, and bias is uh, preconceived idea. Okay, bias is preconceived. Discrimination is, uh, no, uh, oppression is action. Anything else you want to add to that? Right. So when we do the experiential activity, a lot of times we'll talk about whether we're all racist or whether racism can be reversed. And part of the reason why we're so afraid of that word is because we don't know what it means. 
right? We like to focus on interpersonal prejudice so we don't have to talk about systemic oppression. So if you're talking about racism as a system of oppression, well, it's much harder to reverse that, right? Remember when just five years ago we thought, or eight years ago, we thought we were post-racial? <laughs> right? And that's because we confuse the difference level of power. Just because one family is in the White House doesn't mean the systems have changed, right? So again, I'll say this. Bias is universal. It's not the shark, it's the water. All of us are biased. I am biased. Say it with me. I am biased. One more time. I am biased. This is what the science tells us. And if we stop being afraid to use the word, we will not investigate whether our hiring or admissions practices and bi our bias will investigate how. Because everything that I named before, your family, your education, where you get your media from, it's your bias. All of that. Prejudice is when you start to become more conscious and you apply stereotypes to any group of people, right? Discrimination is when you add action to that in a way that impacts others. You have to have power to discriminate. You can decide who's hired, who's admitted, who's served by your business, right? That's discrimination. Oppression is that discrimination writ large at the systemic level. This is the economic systems, the criminal justice systems, the media, the education systems. When these kinds of discriminatory practices are baked into systems, they are pressing folks at a much wider level. I want to get to questions, but I'll teach you just two more concepts. What do we do about all of this bias and discrimination? A lot of times what's going on is that we're so afraid to be brave because we're afraid of making a mistake. Here's another thing I want you to acknowledge. You're going to make a mistake. I've been doing this for 20 years, and I constantly make mistakes for those communities that I'm not a member of, constantly, even for my own community. So I'm going to make a mistake. Say it with me. I'm going to make a mistake. So the question isn't whether you're going to make a mistake. It's how are you going to recover? My invitation to you is with curiosity and humility. This is Dr. Melanie Turvalon. She did research at Children's Hospital to investigate why patients weren't listening to doctors. And she found something astounding. It's because doctors weren't listening to patients, right? She began to teach people to practice a humble curiosity about the culture of their patients and not to stand just on our excellence and our intelligence, but to be humble and curious about the cultures of other people. So cultural humility is the invitation. There are many practices to notice if you're defensive, to continue your own education, to consider non-dominant perspectives. And we talked about this already, but one thing I want to say is if you are living in the red zone every day, you need more time in the green zone, right? If you have fear about whether you'll be safe in the bathroom in a country, whether you're wearing your hijab, then you need more time in the green zone. This is why we have special programs for women and for people of color and for other folks is because folks need more time in the green zone. So there's lots of practices, but the three things I want you to remember are to be brave, be humble, and to be persistent. Thank you. So I think we have time for just a couple of questions. I love the yellow zone, so I'm open to challenges. Let's all be in the learning edge together. A couple of questions, feedback, thoughts. If you can offer them succinctly, we have about Five minutes or so? Yes. Hi, I'm going to sort of take an opportunity to get on my soapbox. Um, I'm a nurse. OK. I I I'm going to ask you to make room for folks to ask questions, so short soapbox. Really quick. OK. So how have you thought about, particularly on this campus, um, there's a lot of bias, I think, and uh, um, even marginalization of people that aren't physicians in the medical community or mm -hmm. in other non-recognized, uh, uh, you know, colleges or schools on the campus. And how, how can we address that from the diversity and inclusion standpoint and belonging? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot of bias about just about everything. And so the question is, how can we address bias around other folks who aren't physicians or aren't in the School of Medicine. And so the, we address it the same way we address all biases. We speak about it. We name it. That's the first thing. 
We cannot sweep bias under the rug. How many people were taught to be colorblind? Right? I don't see color. That's a strange idea. If I walk up to you and say, I don't even see your glasses. <laughs> what do you think? I need glasses, right? <laughs> because the problem is we have some negative stigma about being part of one of these other communities. And if we can start to name those kinds of stigmas, then we can get away from the idea that we have to ignore bias and we can begin the micro inclusions to address it. I don't know if the provost talked about her practice of having people redact names from recommendation letters. Did she talk about that? Right? So she did that practice and she handed them out to people to see if they could tell what gender they were. Right? And what did the letters for women say? She is, what are the adjectives? Nice, helpful, collaborative. And what did the letters for men say? Leader, strong, decisive, smart. And you didn't need a lot of prompting to hear that, did you? Right? Know where I go. Everyone knows what that is. And these are recommendation letters. So when we name what bias is, we can start to practice things like redactions. We can start to engage with people by acknowledging the bias that we see and the radical notion that Dr. Turvalon had, asking people the question, how can we be inclusive? If you want to know that you're being whether you're being inclusive, radical thing, ask people. Right? So what we can do is rather than coming up with policies and practices for other people, we can reach out, build those communities, and ask folks what they need in order to feel respected in a sense of belonging. All right, one more, two more, one or two more, maybe. I know we started a little late. Sorry. I, I have a really uncomfortable one. Okay. So you, you said you like yellow zones. So I do. I'm going to put you in a... So what about things that are true, though? Mm -hmm. I am an Asian woman. I'm a terrible driver. Mm -hmm. I get into the car of a lot of my Asian women friends. Mm -hmm. They're terrible drivers. Mm -hmm. When my kids started to drive, I told them, stay away from Asian ladies who <laughs> are in Priuses right, right. because they break all the time, and you're likely going to run into them. My children, who are raised as kind of inclusive, diversified individuals, said, Mom, you are a racist. You're horrible. You're mm -hmm. stereotyping people. But it is true. <laughs> so here's a, here's, a, here's a, all right, so here's a wonderful thing. When I took the implicit assumptions test by Harvard, I found out that I was biased against black people because I'm in the same water that you're in. It was horrifying. I like to joke, if you've seen Black Panther, that I'm from the Wakanda of the United States, right? So here's the thing, it's baked into us to believe this, but even in your own community, you only know a small sample size. I just got back from Singapore doing a training from LinkedIn, and there are people from Asia, it, the people from Asia don't even see themselves as one entity, right? When I teach in the class, the Asian group breaks themselves into East Asian, South Asian, and Southeast Asian. To speak about any group, there is just nothing that's true for the whole group. It's just not. That's your sample size, right? And then last one, right here. Thank you so much for an amazing talk. My You're name welcome. is Tracy. I'm class of 06 med school. And um, I was wondering, given your K-12 background, can mm -hmm. you tell us some best practices for how do we help instill these things or avoid this in the younger generations in the pipeline? for mm -hmm. kids of that age. Yes, I think there's two things. One, we have a tendency to focus on those people that we want to help, right? That's a wonderful thing for diversity, is to be more inclusive of getting people into the pipeline, but we have to multiply the number of people who are thinking about that my daughter, both of her parents went to Stanford. She went to Spelman College, a historically black college in the South. There's an assumption that people from certain places are the best qualified. We have to start challenging the assumptions of the people who are already in positions of power so that we can broaden the pipeline. More people would be uh, able to get through it if they felt like they would be accepted when they got through. It would be more inviting. So this work is not just to help those people, it's actually to help us. That's why I'm here. Because if we can begin to see past our limited thinking, people will feel more interested. You know, when I tell people that Stanford is free, if you are low income, most of the students, I worked in Oakland for 19 years, they have no idea, right? 
They have no idea the opportunities that we're creating here. We have to get outside our comfort zone and be out talking about the ways we practice radical inclusion. And we actually have to start talking to the people around us who don't create a culture that is welcoming. I want you to go take books to some of the wealthiest schools that reflect the diversity of our world, not just take books to the lowest income schools. What happens if we create a world that is inclusive instead of strengthening people to get through a world that's not? Thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, so next is Patty Fry, who's going to introduce the, the next session.